Hola. Let's take our first deep dive into the different categories of mental disorders. Um, it used to be that um, I could cover virtually everything in this presentation today under the umbrella of anxiety disorders. However, with the DSM-5 revisions, um, they are now separate categories. We do not categorize obsessive compulsive uh, disorders and their related um, different clusters under anxiety disorders, nor do we do trauma and stressor related ones under anxiety. They are separate categories. So um, while this looks like this is going to be a total mouthful, um, it's really not. Ultimately, I'm going to be talking to you about five um, specific sets of disorder today, um, and it really won't be that overwhelming, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, for you to be able to, to differentiate between. But you do want to know that these are ultimately different uh, categories within that new DSM-5 revision. So let's talk about anxiety disorders, okay? So um, what we look at within the field of anxiety disorders as general qualities, they involve just excessive uh, worries of fear and apprehension and um, feelings of tension. Um, and so those can also involve very intrusive thoughts and physical symptoms for things. For example, panic attacks. Um, those who have panic disorder, they truly, I mean, panic attacks are very similar to uh, symptoms of heart attacks, and they can often be interchangeably uh, confused in many respects. So um, these anxiety disorders do seem to have automatic qualities to them that come from the person, okay? So the person doesn't control them, and that's a very significant piece the things those with generalized anxiety like they, they 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 can't stop those thoughts from happening for themselves um, they're just, they're very knee-jerk kind of reactions for them and so the three major types of anxiety disorders that I'm going to talk about with you guys are generalized anxiety panic disorder and then phobic disorders because there are there are three general subsets under the panic disorder stuff as if this isn't already complicated enough um, so let's talk generalized anxiety, okay? Uh, or GAD is how uh, it's also referenced. You'll hear me call that, uh, call it by that quite frequently. These are just, this is a prolonged and unexplainable intense fear um, that is just outside of the realm of normal response. It doesn't seem to be attached to any particular thing. Um, it's almost everywhere in their life. That's not to say that there are not common demonstrations of seeing generalized anxiety. Um, Often those with GAD will have kind of obsessive worries on um, health, on finances. Um, for teens in particular, it's, it's school and um, social circumstances, you know, comparing themselves with peers and peer interactions and stuff like that. Um, studies show anywhere between 4 to almost 7% of the population um, have GAD. It is more common in women than in men, and it does tend to become far more evident uh, in the late teens to early 20s for those who do develop it. You don't see it necessarily uh, before that po point, although it is possible for it to be diagnosed. Many of my students who have GAD, for example, um, were diagnosed with it back in middle school um, to some extent. So let's look at some of these clinical features. So ultimately, um, you have to have this overwhelming sense of worry and, and distress for at least six months to be diagnosed with GAD. That's the first component. You have to be unable to control those worrisome thoughts. And you have to have impairment to either your social functioning, your occupational functioning, or some other area of your, you know, your daily life. So there's that dysfunctionality component from those four Ds in a U that we talked about in the intro to mental disorders. Fourth piece you got to have is the presence of three or more of the following symptoms. We've got restlessness, um, very easily tired, okay, difficulty concentrating, um, or just kind of just on, just can't compute with things in terms of your mind, just go on blank. Heightened senses of irritability, high levels of much, uh, muscle tension, excuse me, um, and sleep disturbances. Many of those who have GAD, they just can't shut off their thoughts, especially when they go to bed. And so that lends itself toward um, poor quality sleep, which contributes to some of that easily fatigued factor, and also that irritability component as well. Um, so these are all the pieces that have to be there for somebody to ultimately be diagnosed with GAD. Now, with panic disorder, um, you do have some indicators that are similar to generalized anxiety, um, but they are exponentially more magnified and they have a very sudden onset within the frame of a panic attack, okay? Um, again, panic disorder is more prevalent in women than men. Um, and so ultimately what has to happen, because they don't always have to be recurrent, 
Okay, you can have one panic attack, be very concerned that you will have them again, have another one again until you start to restrict aspects of your life. Um, that could be still diagnosed as panic disorder because there is that dysfunctionality component and, and also a component of, of the other uh, four Ds in EU. Um, so when we're talking about what a panic attack involves, um, you heard me make reference to the fact that it seems very similar to a heart attack. Look at all of these different symptoms that are present in a panic attack. Shortness of breath, dizziness, trembling, shaking, racing heart, chest pain, uh, and discomfort. Um, numbness and tingling. It's, it's not uncommon for you to hear circumstances of that happening in people's limbs, for example, in their arms. Um, I mean, a lot of this sounds very similar to a heart attack. And it's not uncommon for someone to think they're having a heart attack, go to the hospital and find out, nope, it was a panic attack instead. Um, so it's important to recognize that the duration of an attack and its severity can vary. The average is usually around like 10 minutes roughly, but it's, it's possible for a person to have a panic attack for hours. Um, and if you've ever had a panic attack, you know it is a scary, scary, scary thing. Your brain is telling you that you are dying. Body is in fight or flight mode. Um, and when you have these, these feelings of just, you know, complete disreality um, and feel like you can't breathe or can't catch your breath and, you know, things like that. It's very scary for a person to experience that. And if you have them recurrently, it's even more so. Let's talk about phobias and phobic disorders. Okay, I'm going to put myself up for a smidge. Um, so a phobia is marked by a persistent irrational fear of an object that ends up disrupting behavior. Okay, so this isn't a circumstance where, um, whoop, for example, uh, you end up having, you know, like you see a spider and it's, oh my gosh, this really freaks me out. Um, what this is, guys, is like a former student of mine who has arachnophobia, she would faint when she would see spiders. She would lose consciousness. That is a true scenario of disruption to a person's behavior, okay? People with phobias, they know what they're afraid of, okay? They know their fear is out of proportion of reality. They also know that it just is beyond their voluntary control. They know they should be able to handle being around a dog, for example, if they've got a fear of dogs, but they just can't do it for themselves, okay? It's just not possible for them. It's this like inexplicable component um, to their behaviors. When we look at surveys of people, um, because I love this uh, breakdown here, because it's possible for you to have a fear. You could be afraid of spiders. I have a fear of spiders. I don't have a phobia. I don't like them. Um, but it's also possible for that fear to go into a phobic, a true scenario of a phobic disorder. So you can see all of these scenarios of people in terms of percentages for um, the most common kinds of phobias that are out there. Um, so, you know, th this is just something for you to be able to kind of take a look at for yourself if you're uh, of interest or you know someone who has specific phobias. So let's talk about then the uh, subsets to phobic disorder. I'm going to move myself up again um, because this is, this, and this is important. So what we just got done was talking about specific phobias. These are fears of specific objects, okay? Um, now, there's also the possibility of having something that used to be previously known as a social phobia. Now we call it social anxiety disorder. Um, this is when you have a fear of embarrassing yourself in front of people or putting yourself in a position where people are going to scrutinize you and judge you, okay? Um, so you, you kind of restrict your life um, to avoiding social situations because you don't want people to pass judgment on you. Um, you also have the possibility of something called agoraphobia, which is fear of being in a fear-evoking situation or an unfamiliar situation that you just don't have any level of control over. That would then evoke a panic attack from you. So you start to avoid crowds, you avoid circumstances where those attacks would occur, and you basically um, just kind of start to become um, very uh, minimized in terms of your interactions with others. It's not uncommon for you to see agoraphobics um, to, for all intents and purposes, become shut-ins. They very much restrict their life. They don't leave their house um, because they, just, they are afraid of being overwhelmed by a panic attack in those circumstances. To many kids, social anxiety disorder and agoraphobia sound very similar to one another, um, but they are different. With social phobia, you are afraid of people scrutinizing you. But with agoraphobia, the big piece is you're afraid of your own internal cues, that those panic attacks will overwhelm you in those situations. And so that is ultimately what ends up making you fearful of being in, uh, in social scenarios. So now we move on to another category, but the one is, you know, that's still connected in with issues 
regarding anxiety, which is obsessive compulsive disorders and um, related disorders to that category. Um, so we look at OCD and related disorders as those that share features of um, all-consuming preoccupation um, with you know, whatever thought or, or struggle it happens to be for that person, which is their, you know, in many respects, the obsession, and then the repetitive behaviors that follow with that. So there are three basic breakdowns within obsessive, compulsive, and related disorders, and that's OCD itself which is going to be the one that I'm going to spend the most amount of time in depth on, uh, body dysmorphic disorder, and then hoarding. Um, I'm not going to really hit hoarding simply just because that's one that an awful lot of people are familiar with um, in the sense that, uh, you know, many people have seen it in, um, presented on TV and on movies, and really AP exam is not going to spend an awful lot of time focusing on it. Um, students are fascinated by it, that people just consistently, they just constantly hold on to um, things they don't, uh, it's just, it's basically being a pack rat on steroids. They just cannot get rid of things. And it's it's very much something that um, you hear on the news an awful lot about people who have, you know, like 65 different animals that have taken over their home and they've you know, ruined it. And it's, it's the poor animals are in terrible conditions and the adults in that home are in terrible conditions. And um, so it's a very common thing that you can see from people. But um, for our purposes, to try to just keep things as simplistic as we can, we don't really spend an awful lot of time talking about it on this video, although obviously if you've got questions about it, I'm happy to take a look at those in class with one another. Um, so when we talk about obsessive compulsive tendencies, what we're looking at are any kind of um, persistent unwanted thoughts and then the urges that people feel in order to be able to offset those. A lot of times those are going to end up being rituals. Um, and basically, the entire reason why they feel the necessity to carry those things out is because they feel this just overwhelming distress uh, to be able to get those compulsive thoughts put by the wayside. Okay, so when you look at things that are the most common types of obsessive compulsive um, tics, if you will, um, and uh, the number one is germs. That is by far the one that's most widely um, put out there that most people are familiar with and they know about. Um, but there are other things, you know, massive fears that somebody is going to be uh, having something terrible happen to their home, um, something that could happen to their family members, some kind of death or illness that hits them. Um, sometimes you see circumstances of people having issues with symmetry or order, everything has to have just its right and proper place, and everything just so, and things along those lines. Um, so those are the obsessions. It's always important to recognize that the thoughts are the obsession component. Um, the compulsion component is the rituals. That's the behavioral component to this disorder. This is going to be things like, well, if you've got concern with dirt and germs and toxins and stuff like that, those people feel the necessity to wash their hands um, constantly, you know, and a set number of times with that. They have to bathe constantly, brush their teeth constantly. Um, there are certain circumstances of repeated rituals where people will have to check the door in and out, in and out. Um, make sure that they've locked it, unlocked it, things along those lines. So these are all fairly common obsessive compulsive tendencies. So in the intro to mental disorders video, you heard me talk about how in many respects behaviorists would take a look at OCD and say that this is very much a circumstance of reinforcing behavior. So this is that cycle that I was making reference to in that video, that you've got the obsession, the thought itself, which evokes and creates anxiety and stress. Nobody likes to feel anxious, no one likes to feel stressed out. Um, and so what happens is these individuals then carry out the compulsive ritual. They wash their hands multiple times, and that provides them with a sense of relief. Make no mistake, it, it doesn't make them feel good. Like, they don't get, like, massive amounts of enjoyment out of doing this. It's just, it's something that to them is a necessary evil, that it helps to avoid the anxiety and the stress that they feel over germs. And so ultimately, that's what ends up relieving um, the stress and the tension that they feel because of that is to carry out that compulsive ritual. And then it just continues to cycle uh, over and over and over and over and over again. Now, when you look at brain imaging of those with OCD, look at this PET scan. Um, that is some significant heightened activity, particularly in the frontal lobe, okay? So people with OCD have very high metabolic activity in the frontal lobe, which is involved in um, particularly the prefrontal cortex with focusing our t attention. So it makes sense that those with OCD have this very heavily focused attention on the items that evoke the anxiety and the stress and the tension from them. Um, and so when you look at those brain scans, it's a pretty powerful demonstration of that biological component to this.
that would explain why these individuals uh, have the struggles that they do. So let's talk body dysmorphic disorder. This is when a person has a complete preoccupation with um, the perceived defect they have with their personal appearance, okay? Make no mistake, it could be, it could be real, they just overly exaggerate it for themselves, um, or it could be imagined, okay? So they perceive there to be flaws there um, in, you know, in terms of their physical makeup that aren't really there. Um, the main piece to body dysmorphic disorder is um, that belief in the defect being present in the appearance. And so the preoccupation is absolutely all-encompassing. It is time-consuming. Um, and in many respects, it can be, you know, more common scenarios that you see this are, are things that, like parts of a person's facial features, um, an overly large nose, um, you know, a, a kind of a, a bigger bridge to a nose, for example, people become preoccupied with that. Um, issues with acne or scar, acne scars on their skin or spots on their skin, wrinkles, um, fear of thinning hair, uh, scars that are present. Um, and then in, in some respects, it can even be um, prevalent in terms of um, lending toward other issues like uh, anorexia or bulimia, if need be, if it, if it, if it is um, preoccupied with aspects of, of one's weight. Um, so those with BDD experience major distress over the supposed deformity that they have, okay? And I'm going to apologize. I don't know why my uh, images got so um, funky and covering up some of this stuff. But um, those with BDD, they feel incredibly self-conscious about that defect. And in many respects, it kind of is like that spotlight effect um, that you've been presented with before in earlier units. They just, I mean, they think that everybody is paying attention to that supposed defect. And when they're out in public, everybody is paying attention to it. Um, so they might even lend toward behaviors where they avoid uh, being out in public places and with people to because of fear that they're going to be judged, okay? Um, those with BDD often have very high rates of major depressive disorder, depression, um, and suicidal tendencies because they, they are just so overwhelmed by that perceived flaw. Um, it's more prominent that you see BDD originally present in teen years and earlier years in adolescence. Um, but here's the interesting thing. Most people would have perceived that this is a, a predominantly female uh, disorder because of you know the, the perceived emphasis on, on physical appearance far more for women than men, but that's not true. Um, it affects men and women both equally. Um, so here is an example of someone with um, body dysmorphic disorder um, who when um, going through some of their therapy for this, uh, the therapist asked them, draw your draw a self-portrait basically. Um, and so this is this is ultimately how they drew themselves and, and you know how they perceive themselves, even if this is not truly how it is that they um, are in fact, viewed by others, okay? Um, so let's talk, another very famous scenario is um, a woman called the human Barbie. There are many, uh, there have been many, many, many. There's also now a human Ken out there as well. Um, Sarah Berg is from, uh, she's 50, well, she's older than 50 years now. She's um, closer to um, her, her late 50s by this point. Um, she's had over 100 different procedures and those have cost $1.4 million for the various different cosmetic enhancements that she has attempted to attain for herself. Um, she was recently in the news a few years back for allowing her 16-year-old daughter to get Botox. Um, so unfortunately, my, my videos are not um, popping up the way, or my pictures aren't popping up the way they need to on this video, so I'm going to apologize again. But, I mean, look at the marked difference here in terms of the appearance. A um, hundred different surgeries, and she's okay with allowing her daughter to do this as well. Um, so you can see an awful lot there. Um, Heidi Montag is another um, fairly well-known one, although she's kind of veered away from the spotlight in recent years, but she became fairly famous because of The Hills on MTV. Um, this is her, how she looked originally, and then um, over a span of roughly four years, she went and underwent some major cosmetic surgeries, um, breast enhancement, changes to her nose, um, different fillers put into her face, um, and so she looks uh, just exponentially different. Um, than how she was uh, even four years prior to that point. Um, she has come out and said that she regrets all of the plastic surgery that she did. And, um, she seems to have a little bit more of a handle on things, but um, that's ultimately something to, um, she's another example of this uh, for you to be able to keep in mind for yourself. Um, so let's wrap this anxiety disorder content up talking about uh, trauma and stressor related disorders. 
the number one here uh, and the one we're going to spend our time on so that way we don't convolute you with all of these different types of disorders is post-traumatic stress disorder. So trauma and stressor-related disorders are going to involve those that develop when a person is exposed to a traumatic event, something that evokes distressing or disturbing experiences from them, um, and then ultimately ends up evoking particular behaviors or thought processes in response to that stressful event. So um, oftentimes when you see circumstances of PTSD present itself, stereotypically it's seen in times of war, um, soldiers who go and fight on the front lines and uh, ultimately end up being presented with just horrendously terrible things that they see and witness in their life. And um, unfortunately, as a result, they end up struggling with these particular symptoms. Um, they have to be present for four or more weeks, but um, they have just memories that are absolutely haunting to them in, in forms of either nightmares or flashbacks. They just constantly relive the event that they went through. They can develop social withdrawal. Um, it, it kind of mimics depression in that regard. Things that they used to find interesting and engaging, uh, they no longer do anymore. They are incredibly jumpy and highly anxious. Uh, and they have sleep problems because ultimately those nightmares and flashbacks come to them when they are asleep. Um, and it's just, it's incredibly traumatic and, and difficult for them to get through. So one thing that is often ends up, ended up being kind of a, a big question for post-traumatic stress disorder is why do some people develop it and some don't? Because it's possible for two individuals to go through the exact same life experience, like a war, for example. One develops PTSD, but another doesn't. Um, and when you look at things in terms of uh, resilience to the possibility of post-traumatic stress, um, only about 10% of women, but 20% of men, um, react to traumatic situations and develop PTSD. Um, is that because you know, men are more prevalently, you know, they are more along the lines on the battlefield in military circumstances because the military is a predominantly male profession. Does that mean that's why our higher percentage of it is? Is it because society tells men you're not supposed to feel emotions or be traumatized by things or get emotional about something that is stressful for you? And so they internalize that and they bottle it up and, and you know, that's why they develop their struggles. Um, we don't know. It's interesting to look at Holocaust survivors and the level of just absolute resilience they've demonstrated against traumatic situations um, to not have developed PTSD in response to what it was that they lived through. Um, but it's, it's really fascinating to take a look at and lots of research shows that um, it, surviving a circumstance that required incredible resilience for a person um, and coming out on the other side, persevering, um, lead to an awful lot of growth in an individual. And, and people who struggle with PTSD are still capable of, um, of growing as individuals as well and becoming more aware of themselves and how to better respond to stressful situations when they are overwhelming to them. Um, when you look from the perspective of the learning uh, perspective or behaviorism, they would have a particular response to what explains PTSD. Um, and they would argue that it's fear conditioning, that ultimately what's happened is the person has become conditioned to respond in certain ways that lead toward the anxious feelings. And then that anxiety gets associated with um, other events, which is ultimately stimulus generalization, and that gets reinforced. Um, that would explain, for example, why those that went to war and have PTSD can't handle days like Fourth of July. Um, or Labor Day fireworks, because those fireworks remind them of being back on the battlefield and hearing guns go off and all that other kind of stuff. Um, so that would explain why many um, vets often struggle on holidays like that. Um, fear responses ultimately are um, established in you via observational learning. Um, research has been done on little monkeys, we're all about the monkeys in psychology, um, where those monkeys developed fear when they watched other monkeys be afraid of something. So think about that for a bit. Younger monkeys developed a fear to a snake when they saw others have the fear to the snake, even though they didn't have, those younger monkeys didn't have that before that point. So, you know, if, if you see people who struggle with PTSD, if you are a fellow combat veteran and you witness others um, show fear um, in those kinds of circumstances, it's possible for you to develop some fear and anxiety uh, just via observational learning. From the biological perspective for what explains PTSD, um, a lot of research from twins shows that there can be a biological predisposition to it, um, that there are just some individuals who, 
anxious and fearful responses are established in their personality via temperament um, from their genetics. Twins are more likely to share phobias, for example, and so that, that does have a, a credence towards signifying the importance of genes um, and biological predisposition toward the development of PTSD. Um, now, when you look at um, any of these disorders that we've talked about, you could explain them from a biological perspective. Uh, we talked about how um, the cingulate cortex, specifically the anterior cingulate cortex in the, uh, in the frontal lobe of OCD uh, patients is connected in with that prefrontal cortex as well, and that is highly active for those with OCD. Um, and, and so th th that's present for anyone, whether it's someone with generalized anxiety, someone who has panic disorder, um, and OCD, this seems to be a very um, critical piece to recognizing that there is some kind of biological context to explain why those who are diagnosed with these disorders have such out of proportion responses to the items that scare them and overwhelm them. So um, this is the end of the anxiety and obsessive compulsive and traumatic and stressor disorders content. Um, I know that sounds like a mouthful. Make no mistake, I know that it can be very overwhelming hearing all of these different categories, followed by categories within those categories. Um, we're going to make sure that you know these guys backwards and frontwards. We're going to do a lot of case studies with you guys so you can make sure that you can see and differentiate the various different nuances of these disorders because many of them do sound very similar. Um, so we'll make sure that you're taken care of. But always, if you have any questions, just let me know.